Welcome everyone to this new episode of the Women in Technology Spotlight. It's so great to have you all here. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our great episodes. Today, I have with me Cindy Adam. She is based in Nairobi, Kenya. She is a product manager for Instill Education, and I'm so pleased to have her here with me. Hi, Cindy. Hi, how are you today? I'm very good, especially because you're giving me your time. Um, Cindy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. So I started my career as a lawyer and I remember feeling very heavily emotionally and mentally blackmailed to go through the entire four years and an additional one year in the postgrad law school just so that my parents could say I'm a lawyer right but one of the things I appreciate from my experience um, in law is the way it allowed me to broaden my systems of thinking it allowed me to have a 360 degree view to see things from different angles and sides and to be prepared for all the twists and turns life and career can bring you because you have to always look at the other side's angles, right? And prepare for them sufficiently if you have to perform well as a lawyer. And that's an experience that shaped how I approached my life, how I approached my career. I got into tech shortly after that when I did some tech work as I was attached to the Supreme Court of Kenya. That was a, a few years ago. And then I started my own startup at some point, which was an ed tech startup. We ran it for a long time, for around four years. And uh, while we slabs unfortunately closed it down, it ushered me to the phase of my journey right now as a product manager still in ed tech. So I would say that who I am is someone who's curious mm-hmm. and ambitious. And uh, I have such a free way of considering what life is about. I don't hold on to one line of thinking for too long. Mm-hmm. I don't tie myself down to outcomes. I am committed to the journey of discovery, of becoming, and whatever unfolds on the other side, I welcome it to both hands, knowing that I can handle it. So I think that's (laughs) why. Thank you for that brief introduction. There's a couple of things in there that I, I immediately latched on with my brain. And one thing is the African parents who yes. expect you who have expectations, right? They have expectations of in, in terms of education, in terms of success. And uh, education means specific things for them. They would like us to be doctors, lawyers, and you know all these tangible things. Absolutely. And interestingly, even though engineering might be one of those tangible, tangible things, mm-hmm. I think a lot of our parents don't have any idea what working in tech actually means. So um, tell me a little bit about that transition from law, which they obviously um, liked and, and understood into um, first having your own tech startup, because yeah. um, I mean, that must have been something for them very hard to swallow, it giving was. up that career. It was, and it still is in some ways. Mm-hmm. A few minutes ago, I was talking to my sister and she'd gone to visit my mother and she was telling me, you know, mom is still salty that you're not a lawyer, right? And I was busy telling her that leave Cindy alone. She's got her thing going and she started saying that I'm favoring you. Even now, (laughs) you know, half a decade down, more than half a decade down the line, it's still a hard concept for parents to understand that we are committed to our own lives to our own outcomes and the world is so remarkably different from what it was when they were in their own points where they needed to choose right so I do remember quite clearly one night I was trying to make a case for why I shouldn't be compelled to go to postgrad law and I prepared this um, physical PowerPoint presentation. It was in, uh, it was a big, it was made of big sheets like this one. I don't know. Yeah, right. And uh, I wrote why you should let me not go to law school, right? And I, I think at that time, my thing was getting into uh, agriculture in some way, you know, like modern agriculture, small scale, but still high impact, you know, grow, high, you know, tons of food in your backyard in a way that's sellable. Mm-hmm. So, I remember preparing that very well. And uh, oh, I remember preparing that very well. And uh, I told them one night that they have to, I'm calling them to a meeting Mm -hmm. in the living room. 
So why don't you show up? And they show up. And uh, I have all these things stuck on the wall, step by step by step. Yeah, think about physical slideshows. So <laughs> just, and, uh, I had my points nailed down, color coded, you know, with some points, not too many ones, right? Mm -hmm. Professional. And they listened and they listened. I could see them smiling and nodding and they thought they were agreeing with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finished the presentation and they were like, my dad, I remember, he said, mama, you're such a good presenter. You're still going to law school, but that was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, African parents. Yes. <laughs> right? and, and anyway, long story short, mm -hmm. I had to go and uh, I did. And even though I don't necessarily regret it, I still remember the day I was admitted to the bar and we're walking around the CBD wearing my attire and my dad was the one who came that day you could see the sense of pride with which he walked you know he was in his nice suit and you know greeting everybody I can assure you he didn't know half of those people but he had his lawyer daughter next to him you mm. know yeah and at the time we were talking about I had already started village to nation at that time my former startup and at that time it was like mama tell me again what it exactly village to nation does I think it was the 20th time I was explaining why this is something I've chosen for myself. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why he's not going to have a lawyer as a daughter, you know? So my admission to the bar was an ode to him and to my mom for all the hard work they've done, you know, into getting me to this point. Now he wanted to know what exactly I was doing. And for a while they were okay. I think they found a way to live with it. But every time they're talking to their friend, who's a judge or a lawyer and they're asking them, hey your daughter how is she what does she do now which law firm is she in he had the unfortunate opportunity to tell them that no my daughter is a lawyer who's not a lawyer mm -hmm. then he calls me mama tell these people what exactly you do you know and then i had to have this conversation so many times so right now well they feel like i'm a bit more settled in my career there's still that voice at the back of their head wondering are we failure of parents that we took a daughter to law school and she's not a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a struggle they keep having, but I consider it my responsibility to disappoint them if their expectations of me are not aligned with the kind of life I want for myself. Mm -hmm. So, kill I think. <laughs> I mean, that's so hard. Disappointing your parents is so difficult and it never gets easier. But I feel that there must be some passion within you that drove you to, to take that other path because you found something that was more important to you, more important even than pleasing your parents. Tell me a little bit about what that was that drove you. I've never considered any special specific moment to be the aha moment. All I do know is that even while I was still in college undergrad, I want wanted to have a career that would be impactful. What the impact and how it's, it happened has changed over the years, but at the core of everything I've always wanted is to feel like I'm doing something that matters and it matters not just to me, but to the people around me. It has to make a difference in the world somehow. So what it looked like when I was in college was, you know, doing community service, people with disabilities. Then after college, it looked like setting up digital hubs and training centers for young people in remote locations. Then it transitioned into a full-blown uh, online learning company, so to speak. And uh, my transition into tech as it is right now began, I think the tech side of it really started when I was attached to the Supreme Court and I had to create this uh, tracking system so that I could save the court hours because court had been delayed for around two weeks. They couldn't track which cases had been served and which had hadn't. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I brought together a lot of uh, no code tools, combined them together, you know, and they used it for quite a while. They didn't pay me for that, but I remember the sense of fulfillment and joy that came with building something that matters, you know? Mm -hmm. I remember, I, I didn't know how to program. I still don't know how to program, but my curiosity leads me. And I checked online and it's all the tools available that I could leverage to build something that works, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, when that happened, that's when I went full-blown tech. 
and uh, built this online platform. Obviously, with an incredibly awesome team. And right now, as the product manager of an institution that's building, you know, a virtual school for teachers across Africa, I feel like uh, it's a bit full circle, you know. But I'm still excited to see what the future holds. But that's how the transition has been. Not straightforward, but still very much worth it. I love this, and I think what I hear is that it's not about tech; it's about yeah. the mission. It is, and of course, um, what tech has given us mm-hmm. is the tools to actually make a difference. And you said you you created this platform for. Um, education for remote um, areas, right? And and it was all around educating people and bringing education to people. Mm-hmm. And I th- and and what I love in about the times we're in is the fact that you can have a vision and and something that you want to achieve. And tech has given us the tools to make that happen. Absolutely, mm-hmm. it's never been a better time. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I do know that um, you had to to pivot to to taking a job again because you weren't as financially successful as you had expected, which happens with startups. Um, it's not necessarily a reflection of what you wanted to do. And I still think uh, there there is a place for for what you want to do and uh, to achieve. And tell me a little bit about uh, you know becoming a product manager for in in this education company and what you do on a daily basis. And what you mm-hmm. like about it? Yeah. So what made me, I remember at the time where after, just after I had to shut down the startup, then this time I had to look at myself and like, Cindy, if you really look back, you did a lot of different things. Like, and some, some of them are so wildly different from each other. So how in the world are you supposed to create a CV that can get you a job, you know, without looking like a confused, you know, person with a hand in everything the truth is I am good at a lot of things because I built the startup and that's not a bad thing so I had to sit down with myself and figure out what are some of the core things that I feel I I am so good at that I can in a way that also allows me to grow into an even better version of it mm-hmm. and so having initially built the initial um, website then built coordinating the building of the new platform, product management felt like a really natural segue into the career that could open up a lot of more opportunities for myself. So product managers, essentially, they say, some folks say it's the CEO of a product, Mm -hmm. but not really. You have to lead that without influence at all because management has its own vision and ideas of what they want built. You know, the various teams have the different pain points that they have that they want to address in this new product that you're building, for example. So there are a lot of competing interests. Sometimes they're aligned, a lot of times they're not. So a product manager is the person that takes insight from management and takes all these insights for all the little teams and comes up with a list of perhaps features that should go into this thing you're building then you work with the development team to build mm-hmm. it for instance yeah so some of my favorite products are like canva canva it's like a design tool you know i keep saying god bless the lady who is behind Canva, like I hope she's having a really good day because it's one of my favorite products it makes my work so easy you know, I can build beautiful, beautiful presentations, you know, create a lot of different good things. It's one of my favorite platforms, right? But when I'm thinking about the kind of people who have to bring Canva together or Spotify together, you know, I'm thinking about all the other things that they had to, they're competing with Photoshop perhaps in some ways, right? Which is really technical and stuff. And they have to build something that's simple. Maybe someone in management wanted something that's, you know, a bit more complicated so that it's, you know, maybe, okay? Mm-hmm. Or someone, uh, people in marketing have their own ideas or someone in sales has their own ideas. So the product managers at Canva has to, have, has to make sure that they remain true to the essence of what it is they're building while also ensuring that they're building a product that marketing can sell wonderfully, sales can, you know, easily get people on boarded and, and all those different things. So uh, on a day-to-day, I'm in a lot of meetings. 
I remember yesterday, I think I was <laughs> in a two hour meeting and immediately after there was a one hour meeting and I almost wanted to shoot myself because <laughs> these meetings are, are necessary. But at the same time, can we have like, like breaks in between you? Because it can be a lot, you know? And then you have to balance the interests of, you know, the powers that be and the other teams that you're also building it for. Because internal teams also have to, you know, they have to use the product. If they're feeding in the content, they have to enjoy feeding in the content, you know. And then there's the end users, you know, yeah. they want, they, they need to be delighted to use the platform, you know. So it's a lot of psychology, a lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a joy seeing the process of building something that wasn't into becoming something that is, you know, it's a bit godlike, if you ask me. So what I hear is that as a product manager, you're very much a hub, a hub Mm -hmm. where everything comes together, everyone comes together and then, you know, brings their information, their wishes, their dreams, and Mm -hmm. and you have to take that and you have Mm -hmm. to um, to, to build a conglomerate that actually works as a product without losing the strategy, making Mm -hmm. sure that everyone's happy. And, and you, you already mentioned psychology, but I want to also mention communication. I think that takes a lot of communication it, skill. It does. So I feel that, um, again, this is product management is a job where women are uh, especially suited, a lot yes. of women, you know? Yeah. So of course you have to have this technical acumen, you have to like technology, but I think uh, an important part is empathy, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Listening to these different people who have different points of views and, and you know, then taking those, mm-hmm. making them feel heard, taking yeah. everything and building something that they will be happy with. So that sounds on the one hand, like a really difficult job because, um, mm-hmm. you know, all this moderation between teams. Can be. <laughs> but yeah. as you said, it mm-hmm. also sounds like something that could be an amazing uh, amount of fun. Mm-hmm because you get to build something great and influence. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But one of the things that, just going just a second uh, back, mm-hmm. one of the things that is really hard to do and quite often not possible is making everyone happy. For mm-hmm. some people, they recommend things that doesn't either go along with the strategy, the overarching strategy of the company, or they are not a priority to everything else Mm -hmm. so you either have to say no diplomatically or delay it Mm -hmm. you know they're not happy but one of the things I've learned how to do is to disagree but commit you know because sometimes even I have my own opinions about what are some of the features that are important you know but it still doesn't go with you know what the management vision at that point could be and that's okay too so it's finding what's the best possible outcome that can take us where we want to go it doesn't matter you know where an idea comes from what we want is we start from the end goal this is what we need so where that journey takes us may have a lot of detours and a lot of bumps but will it get us where we want to go so it is it's challenging but in a lot of good ways and the fun part is seeing how something you're building is coming together. You know, it's, I guess it's a bit like art and chess. Yes, I love that art. You know? yeah, <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, Cindy, um, you mentioned something about, you know, the journey, having detours and, and you know, not necessarily going as you expected. And I think that's also true for your journey a little bit. I mean, um, when you look at what you're doing, I mean, I'm, I must say, I'm so proud of all these young African women who are now going into tech, changing the world, doing amazing things like you. And I just, when you look into the future, maybe a couple of years from now, um, what do you see yourself doing? Or where would you want to go if you just dream? Um, that's a very interesting question because... Five years ago, if you asked me this is where I would be, I couldn't picture it mm-hmm. because I realized, and now even more so, acknowledging just how multifaceted I am as a person and as a professional, you know, it becomes really hard to dream one dream because part of me feels like I'd be locking out all the other possibilities for myself. 
-hmm. But some of the things that I do hope remain constant is I am doing work I deeply care about. Mm -hmm. It touches a lot of people and that makes me feel energized every morning. Mm -hmm. I want five years from now that work is such a joy that I feel blessed to be alive that I keep looking forward to Mondays. Yeah. And I want to make sure that I'm paid a shit ton of money for it. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> touching on that because yes. I think that's <laughs> something that a lot of women might forget about. And yes. I think it's important to mention, yes, you mm -hmm. have to have passion and it's good to know um, that you're doing something meaningful, but yeah. you don't forget that you have to have money and yeah. you should get paid for what you do because you're <laughs> investing your resources. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, you know, um, always having something that that makes you want to get up in the morning and makes you passionate about going to work on Monday and doing something meaningful. Yeah. And so so what is your meaning? What is your why? Because I, I uh, there's this very strong mission behind education. Mm -hmm. Is that what you want to do? Educate people or what is it that drives you? My why at this moment and who knows if it changes is if it changes is allowing young people to explore the full extent of what is possible for them mm -hmm. especially young africans i think for those who may not be as lucky as i am to be able to have the privilege of disappointing their parents they may feel like they only have one alternative whatever it is they studied for so it's very easy to get clogged in mentally like I went to school for this you know maybe my first two jobs are in this area and this is the only thing that I can do for me my why is to allow people to see the limitless options that are available for them as professionals as people and the kind of life it could unlock for them you know tech has money and this is a lot of money And I think a lot of people also think that tech has to be deep tech, you know, AI, VR, robotics, going to the moon and working for Tesla. All those are grand things. Mm -hmm. And for those who are aligned that way, that is massive. But there are a lot of people who don't know that you can get into tech without needing to code. Mm -hmm. I still can't code, but I'm thriving because I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So... I want people through the testament of my life to see what is possible for them if they don't limit themselves. And I feel like I'm doing that in a number of ways when I'm able to tell someone, oh, I'm in tech. Like, oh, how long did it take you to learn programming? Like, I don't program. But I can still be paid programmer type salaries mm -hmm. because I'm really in value. And I only got to gonna the value that I can offer because I'm curious I question things I learn I'm very intentional you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. about growth personal growth and growth in all the facets so uh, I think that's such a good point you know um, the level of technique uh, of tech that you have to to go to because we are now living in a world where tech is everywhere. I just had this interesting conversation with another woman about the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. this is our world now, tech is mm -hmm. everywhere. And you need tech to, uh, to, to do basically everything. If you just Absolutely. want to sell something, you have to have some kind of, uh, maybe a mobile phone for payment or some, some cash desk or, or whatever it is, you know? Um, so there's, there's no, part of our world that hasn't been touched by tech and of course not for every part of that world you need to be a programmer but you have to understand maybe it's sometimes it's even more important to understand that part of the world and understand how tech could help that part of the world to do something really useful with tech and um, again again I think that a lot of women think more around those lines and I, I like that you said the woman behind Canva because mm -hmm. I think she also went and, and thought okay um, how can I make um, creation easier I mean Photoshop is a great tool but you ha it has a steep learning curve if you want to do something useful Absolutely. Canva doesn't I mean you just go there and you create something nice and um, everyone nice. can do it you know very nice yeah 
this. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of approach we need. We have to lower the threshold uh, or, or mm -hmm. the, the step between, you know, the world and the technology so that everyone can use those tools. So, yeah, I like that mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, um, curiosity is a big topic in, in your life. And mm -hmm. um, is that also something you would recommend other young women to have or young people to have? What is it you would tell them to do, what mm. they need to succeed? Curiosity is a big deal for me because I wouldn't have half the career I have if I wasn't curious. That's how I've literally found all the tools that I use right now in my line of work. Something like Figma. I used to be a really good drawer slash artist, but now I use tech to draw and design beautiful things. I'm pretty good at that if I do say so myself, right? Mm -hmm. So I may not be like a full-blown UX or UI designer, or, you know, the kind of people who, you know, design beautiful websites and interfaces. I can, I have done it. It's not the career I have like full-time, but I wouldn't have known the Figma existed if I wasn't trying to design something, you know? And Google... Is so underrated. I think Google should be classified as an ed tech company because Google is almost exclusively responsible for everything that I've learned up to this point, you know? And my curiosity sometimes manifests in small ways. If I, I'm reading something and I see a word I don't recognize, I'll go and Google it just to know what it means. I don't have to remember it afterwards, but I refuse to be stuck in, oh, I don't know that. And I'm moving on. I don't think I'd ever be comfortable with myself if that's the kind of world I was stuck in, you know? I'm very intentional about consistently learning things, you know, and providing myself an opportunity to learn. So what I would tell other people is to allow yourself to explore. Mm -hmm. If you feel in any way drawn to anything, however small, however big, you know, just lean in just a bit towards it and say it's okay to change your mind. So follow it just a little bit, just a bit and see where it takes you. It's okay to get there and change your mind. It's okay to, you know, do it and decide this is not for me or I thought it's going to be more fun than this or this is a lot harder and I don't want to put in the energy and effort into learning more of it. It's okay, you know, but don't ever let it just be an itch that's not scratched. You know, there's so many things I tried. There's a time I tried being a model, you know, and uh, did not go well. I wasn't, I wasn't, no, not at all, not at all, you know. And it was important for me to explore that. So I never wonder what if, you know, what if that could be part of my life in some way. And there's so much joy that you can experience in life if you allow yourself to experience new things, even hard things, even intimidating things, you know. And you decide, you know, okay, it's hard, but I'm having fun. So let me keep doing it. Or it's hard, but I don't think this ain't for me. And that's okay too, you know? So life is more rich that way, I think. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think one of the most important things, especially if you're young, is trying as many things as possible to find out what's the best for you. Because Absolutely. you can know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't optimize too soon, you know? Yeah. A lot of people optimizing when you're 20 you know it's fine to you know go to school and you find really excited about this thing and you choose to follow it consistent that's fine but don't don't say that this is my whole life mm -hmm. you have several lifetimes in one in any one person you know i think people die once but they can live several different times and i want to be able to live several different times when i'm a product manager and who knows maybe in five years i'll be in an entirely different field, maybe with a tech component, you know, but I could be a good public speaker, you know. Yeah. Who knows? I am certain you could be a great inspirational speaker, Cindy. I, I really think so. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I want to thank you for taking this half hour to talk to me and, and inspire others and be a role <laughs> model to other young women all over the world. Um, it was a, such a pleasure talking to you. I, I loved the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ronke. You know, one of the things that I enjoy about you is your energy, you know, and it just radiates from within in a way that inspires my own to just radiate. And uh, at the moment I met you and we had the initial conversation, it was delightful. And I hope that we keep 
in touch and keep having delightful conversations that hopefully touch someone. You know, I know that was so much, okay. Cindy. I would love that. I have so yeah. many ideas of what we could do. So <laughs> absolutely, thank you. And if you ever come down this side, my offer stands. Just reach out to me, okay? Let me go. Thank you so much. <laughs>